Good morning and welcome. It's, uh, it's good to be here and it's good to take some time to reflect on some truth in the words of those songs we've sung this morning. And as we give our offerings, to be reminded that uh, all that we have is a gift from God, belongs to Him. And I am uh, I'm just thankful to God for an opportunity to gather with our brothers and sisters to worship together this morning. And uh, so whether you're here in person or watching online, uh, praise God. And uh, would you just pray with me as we begin? Father God, I love you this morning. We love you. We've chosen to to set apart this time this morning. I pray it's because we want to be with you. So Father, as we uh, open your word, we invite your Holy Spirit to do your perfect cleansing, transforming work in us as necessary to make us more like the people of Christ. And so, Father, uh, might our hearts be uh, open to truth and to change that needs to take place as we encounter you and your truth. In Christ's name, we pray these things. Amen. Well, welcome. I'm Pastor Van Holloway, one of the elders here, and uh, this summer we have been going through a study through the book of Titus, and if you have your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to open them up to the book of Titus or take out your device that has God's Word on it, and the book of Titus is a real small book, just a couple pages long in most of our Bibles, near the end, lengthwise of the New Testament, get past Corinthians and Galatians, and then you'll find a Thessalonians and a Timothy and then a Titus. I just want to encourage you to be there. We'll be in chapter 3 in our study today. But I want to just, uh, I think, remind us once again of where this little book or letter came from and uh, just a little bit maybe of the, the context of it once again. So Titus was one of Paul's buddies, one of Paul's friends. And Titus is serving God on the island of Crete. It's this little island that sits in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And on this island there are little groups, assemblies of followers of Christ have come to know Christ, and Titus is is one of these church leaders or influencers, and and he has a lot of weight, a lot of responsibility. There are no mature Christians in the first church. There's nobody that can say they've been a follower of Jesus for decades, And this whole church thing is new. Maybe a synagogue idea is familiar to some people. But it's hard. And it's lonely. And it's difficult. And one day some messengers came up to Titus and they brought him a note. And he opened it up and realized that it was from his friend Paul. And the book of Titus that's recorded in the Bible is our opportunity to see what Paul wrote down to tell his friend Titus about. And Titus, I just can imagine, he opens it up and he says, oh, it's from Paul, a servant of God. I remember when Paul was here in this island with me and 
these people, God did an amazing thing and people became believers in various little pockets on this island and then Paul had to leave. And I was left here. And it's been hard. And Paul says, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's people. Just reading in chapter 1, verse 1 of this letter that we now break down in the chapters, but Titus was just re- reading it. It's this note from Paul. Paul says, I'm writing to you because I want to grow the faith of God's people. I want to share more truth that, that they'll get truth that leads them to godliness, to godly living. And verse 4 of chapter 1, this is to you, Titus, my true Son in the faith. That encouraging words. As he opens this little note. That Paul, the great apostle, the great missionary, says, you're my son, my true son in this common faith that we have together. And then these are the words that sometimes I skip over when I read through the, these letters from Paul, but Grace and peace from God and Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. I'm not sure what kind of day Titus was having when he opened this letter, but it probably came at the perfect moment when he needed to be reminded of some things and told of some things, including about God's grace and God's peace. That comes from God through Christ Jesus, our Savior. And several times throughout the book, God and Jesus are referred to as Savior because Paul does not want Titus to forget that there was a starting point in his life with Christ. He, at one time, needed a Savior. And we don't know when Titus was born again and gave his life to following Jesus this new way. But at one point in Titus' life, he needed a Savior. Then verse 5 of chapter 1, Paul writes in his little message, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished. Yeah, Paul, why didn't you help me finish more of it? <laughs> right? There's a lot unfinished. You don't know these people. There's a lot of work to be done. But one of the jobs was to appoint elders, ordain elders in the various churches. And so we've talked about this earlier in our Titus series, but Paul Courage is Titus. Go find some godly men, some men who are blameless and make sure that they become the leaders and the influencers, the pastors in those churches and those little groups of believers. Because there's lots of other people who will be glad to speak up for lots of other reasons and impure reasons, right? And he talks about that in verse 10 of chapter 1. There are, he calls them rebellious people who are the influencers in this church. And it ends there uh, in verse 16 of chapter 1. These people claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny Him. They're detestable. I don't know if we ever use that with a word of someone that's in the assembly. They're detestable disobedient and unfit for doing anything good. So Titus, that's how dangerous these false leaders are. So raise up, look for godly leaders and train up these little assemblies to find men that will be stewards of God's truth. And that will do good. The letter goes on. Chapter 2. Titus, you teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. There's truth that needs to be taught. And through chapter 2, there's truth that needs to be taught to the older men and the younger men and the older women, the younger women. Truth that needs to be taught to the slaves, to the servants. And as you read through that, within the church, 
what the church is to be about as people relate to each other and train each other up and encourage each other and confront each other in the way they are living their lives so that their lives are consistent with what they believe in and consistent with who they believe in. And then we get to chapter 2, verse 11. And uh, I've been encouraged. Some of you have worked at putting these verses to memory. Right? For the grace of God, it's appeared to all people and it brings salvation to all people. God's grace. And it teaches or trains us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live our lives self-controlled, uprightly, and godly in this present age. While we wait for the glorious hope, the return of Jesus Christ, our Savior, right? Jesus, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, from all unrighteousness, and to purify us to set apart a people for Himself who are eager to do what is good. What, what a rich few verses. And maybe it's not in memory yet, but write it on a card and stick it on the dashboard of your car. Put it on your mirror in your bathroom and read it in the morning. Set it on your desk. Take a minute and write these verses down in the page of your prayer journal and come back to them. It's the grace of God that allows us to live out a Christian life while we wait for Christ to return. And then we get to chapter 3, which we're going to look at today. And Titus continues just to look at this little note from, from Timothy and in Titus chapter 3. If you would just like to read along with me in the first few verses, it says this. Titus, my son, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceful and considerate, and to show true humility towards all men. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we've done, but because of His mercy He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things, that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. You have maybe a spot on your bulletin or some of you bring a notebook. You want to write a few things down. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about our witness. A renewed witness. And there is an unbelieving world watching us. And what do they see in God's people. And uh, Titus is, is being reminded by Paul to s remind the people that call themselves believers. The people in these churches. So what is being taught in these verses and what's going to be taught this morning is directed towards those who claim to be in Christ, those who claim to be believers in God, those who are to live godly lives. And so, Titus, 
remind people to practice what they preach. It's one way to say that. Or to live a life that's consistent with what we say. Or to be gospel changed people. Not just people who have believed in the gospel, but our belief has changed us. And so, uh, three quick little points, then I'll hit them pretty early and then come back to one of them as I close today. But if you want to jot these down, I'll leave a little gap between them. But in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, the first point is these are marks of God's people. What God's people should be like, or marks of godly people, or marks of a healthy church. Letter B, we'll get to it eventually, but Titus chapter 3, verse 3, the marks of those who don't know God, those without God, those outside of Christ, or marks of ungodly people, or those outside of the church. And then, The third point in Titus 3, verses 4 through 7, as this section closes, gospel transformation. What the gospel, how it changes people. Gospel transformation. So if we start out back in uh, that first point, the marks of God's people, marks of godly people, just begins this way. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. I think if there's one summary contrast between godly people and ungodly people that comes out of this little passage is this, that God's people should be marked as people that are known as doing good. And ungodly people people outside of God are not able and cannot and do not do good. And there's just some descriptions that are given to what that means here of of doing good. To slander no one. To be peaceable and considerate. And to always be gentle toward everyone. People without excuse. We can't choose and decide who it is we will treat with consideration. Be gentle toward everyone. Slander no one. Be peaceable and considerate. Always to be gentle toward everyone. Uh, No excuses, no loopholes. It starts out that verse 1, it's in relationship to rulers and authorities. We'll come back to that one and to be obedient. But it ends with towards everyone. So I... uh, When I first started attending this church, uh, way back in the late 1900s. <laughs> uh, one of the deacons, I remember uh, sitting down with him and he was a servant. It's the word deacon. He was a servant. He worked hard around this church and worked hard in serving God's people. I remember he would uh, take me out to a uh, restaurant. We would go to the steakhouse that used to sit up on the hill that's now that coffee place. Ponderosa Steakhouse. Anybody remember Xenia's Ponderosa? Right? And uh, I learned some things uh, about my friend this deacon. And I learned, and it kind of confused me a little bit, that I learned that he was not much of a deacon when he got into a restaurant. And it took me a while to figure this out because he was paying for service and he was paying for something good to eat. And all he did 
if things weren't perfect, was complain and gripe and argue. And in that setting, he was not a godly man. And I didn't, I mean, I'm about 20 years old, and this is a, a man who's, who's in his 40s or 50s, and he's walked with God for a while apparently, but there was something about in that restaurant setting, and maybe it was in another area of his life too, that that's where I saw it, where he had demands. He had rights. He was paying good money and expected things to be done his way, the way he liked it. And in those moments, he was not showing consideration and gentleness towards all people. And I've never forgotten that because of the contrast in his life, because in other areas of his life, he was a gentle, helpful servant. And I think I've been thinking through this for a couple of weeks, this passage, and this week was just thinking that perhaps in all of us, there's some segment of life, some situation, some place, some time where we can justify that we don't have to be godly in this moment. That we have rights. You can't tell us what to do. You can't tell me what to do. You're here to serve me. And we go off on somebody. And I don't know where that is in our hearts, but I pray this morning that if it's somewhere in your life, that as I go through the rest of this passage with you, that God reveals it to you and that you seek forgiveness and you say, God, I don't want to be that kind of person because that's not who godly people are. People who claim the name of Jesus should be subject to rulers and authorities and be obedient and be ready to do whatever is good. Whatever is good. To slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate. And always be gentle toward everyone. Towards everyone. We go to the next verse. Because at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. What's that one time? As Titus reads that, and what, what is that one time when we were foolish and disobedient and hateful? What was that one time? That's referring to the time before we experienced Jesus. Do you get that? The time before we experienced Jesus, it was all about us. It was all about our rights. It was all about what's good for me. And it was a battle to see who could get the most for themselves. And we were a part of that battle. That's how it used to be. We were foolish and we were like that. And so why is it that when we see people in our community and they make life difficult for us, that we feel justified in acting like we used to act? They're okay acting that way because they may not know God. And we used to act just like that. We have that in us, that same tendency to be selfish and to be demanding and to treat someone unfairly. But if we have Christ in us, we don't have to live that old way. In fact, we're not supposed to live that old way. The way of ungodly people of those outside the church. Foolish and disobedient. Deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. It's driven by what we can get in the immediate. It doesn't matter who we step on, right? We lived 
back in that time. In malice and envy. Being hated and hating one another. But then verse 4. Titus, my brother, my friend. God showed up in our lives. And he's done something. And why? Just a few verses after Titus 2, 11 through 14, does, does Paul take up some precious space in this letter to, to almost repeat it again? God's done something great. Right? In Titus 2, the grace of God appeared bringing salvation. Well, in Titus chapter 3, verse 4, but when the kindness and love of our God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. It was His grace, His love, His loving kindness, His mercy. God stepped toward us. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us. Why is this important? Because Jesus didn't treat us the way we deserved. And if we get that, if we get and understand and reflect on God's goodness, His grace, His mercy, His loving kindness that was extended to us when we didn't deserve it, as a free gift, if we get what we've received, then we should be people who can give that same undeserved free gift to others. Do you get that? That if we've gotten it ourselves, God's grace, God's loving kindness, God's mercy, then when someone doesn't respond to us in the right way we think, and we want to demand our rights and our privileges, and we've paid for this. We should get this. How do you respond? Out of the knowledge that God responded to you with grace and mercy? Oh God, help us to be a people that in our community our witness is consistent with who we are. People should know about our love and our kindness and our generosity and our graciousness. We're too quick to think that people don't deserve it. Oh God, we didn't deserve your grace. Then he continues on here. He saved us through the washing of rebirth. That's the, uh, the idea, the concept we talk about sometimes is regeneration. A new birth. To be born again. To be given a new life. It's repeated over and over again throughout the New Testament. It talks about God's people. We're a new people given a new birth, a new identity. To be born again, to regenerate. All right, I have a water softener at home that regenerates periodically. All right, starts fresh, all new, over again. Genesis, generate, to make, to produce. Genesis, in the beginning, God created. God made something to regenerate, to make again, to make new. What does it say here? He saved us through the washing of rebirth. We've been born into a new family. We belong to God. In 1 Peter 1, maybe you want to just jot this down. In 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 6, it's almost a parallel passage to what Paul's writing here to Titus. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 6. Praise be to the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, Peter uses mercy. In Titus, it's grace, His loving kindness, His goodness. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth. There's the word. Into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. We become into God's family. 
co-heirs with Christ, right? God's children. He becomes our father. It's the whole inheritance idea, right? And it's kept in heaven for you. Who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Why is it in all these passages throughout the Old Testament, it talks about the gospel and salvation over and over and over again. You used to live this way. God came into our lives. He's changed us. He's given a new birth and he's with us. He's giving us a hope until he comes, right? It's like the whole story is just wrapped up in here. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. You know, when you're suffering grief for trials, it's when someone steps on you. When someone takes advantage of you. And you don't think it's fair. And they're yelling at you, so you better yell back at them. And you justify in that moment that you're right and they're wrong. And in that moment, they're not getting the message of the gospel from you. They're getting the message they're hearing from everybody else in a world that's fighting with one another all the time for place and position. If we go back to Let's finish up Titus 3. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. A renewal by the Holy Spirit, that's that Spirit's transformation. I don't know if you've been around believers long enough or even have taken time to think in your own life if you're a believer. How has God sweetened your walk how has God changed and transformed you what what tendencies and habits and addictions is God taking from you what new appetites is he giving you not that we're perfect but can you think of anything that God has been changing in you or in someone you love to transform you more like the God who lives in you? In Romans 12, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. I mean, we can't get away from that word. It's always His mercy, His grace, His love. God has done so much for us. In view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. We can read it, but isn't life in our world often we're expected to sacrifice? To give up and let go of? It's not worth that extra dollar. Let it go. Be gracious. Be kind. Be gentle. Don't argue. Be obedient to the authorities that are around us. The world is watching. How's our witness? If you act differently like this, like a godly person should, people will take note. People won't dread seeing you coming. They'll actually be glad when you show up because you'll be known as a person who does good. Who does good to all people. And as I, I don't want to say wrap up because I got a little more to do here. But you know what? I couldn't get past the, uh, the first start of chapter three. And maybe it's because uh, it's something that I'm still working through and struggling with and trying to figure out. But it starts out in chapter three that godly people, marks of God's people, Marks of those in a healthy church should be subject to rulers and authorities and be obedient. And I just want to come back to that one for a little bit. 
How do we do that? And I think uh, I have a tendency and we have a tendency to often go to that little statement in Acts that summarizes uh, the, the truth in God's Word that we should obey God rather than man. But I don't think we spend long enough thinking about what it means to obey God and I think we put lots of other things into that category of obeying God that may not be long in that category. There are things that are part of our culture or our independence or our rights or our privileges. And we say, well, we're not going to obey man that God has put in authority over us. Because we, we don't have to. We're obeying God. <laughs> and over this last year, or year and a half of craziness in our culture and in our world, I couldn't get past these first few ideas of godly people are to be subject to rulers and authorities and to be obedient. Galen said to me once, I don't know if you remember this, Galen, you said to me once a few years back, it was right after a presidential election, and Galen said, did, did you vote for God's man? <laughs> I've never forgotten that. Now, I don't know if that was something that originated with you or if you got that, that statement that, that rattled and still rattling my heart and brain a little bit. Did I vote for God's man? No, I did not in that moment. However, the people that God places in authority over us are people that God places in authority over us. Josh Hensley uh, gave me a book uh, uh, a few weeks ago called Joseph uh, and the Gospel of Many Colors, written by Vody Bakken Jr. And I finished it up a couple weeks ago and I set it aside not thinking that I'd ever look at it or think about it again. And then all of a sudden I start going through this passage and thinking about rulers and authorities and thinking about the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis and how God took him to a place of, of authority in the land of Egypt and that God's providence was at work all the way throughout the book. And his brothers were doing things and things were happening around him and to him and yet God's plan was unfolding at the same time. And I, it just got me thinking about this and there's some things in the book that, that were written there but God puts people in authority for us to honor and be subject to and obey God puts them there and when we serve them we're serving God and it has been so easy and our, our news media and talk radio and all the rest of the noise out there to so much to destroy people who are made in the image of God. And God has put them in places of authority over us. And Paul says, remind us to be subject to them and obedient to them. It's not enough to ignore authority or to claim ignorance. Paul doesn't say don't have any response. Paul says you've got to do good to them. You have to do something positive. And God's sovereignty, His love, His kindness, His grace, His power are all working together for our good and His glory. And in Romans 8.28 Many of us know this first. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. Those all things include those that God puts in authority in your lives. Whether that's a president or, or a judge, a city council or a mayor, a police officer who questions you, <laughs> 
a boss, a teacher. Sometimes they're tyrants. Sometimes they're foolish. Sometimes they make bad decisions. But we need to think about how God is asking us to talk about them. How do we talk about them? We are to slander no one. There's not an exception. There's not an asterisk. We're to slander no one. We're to do good to all people. God works for the good of those who love Him. All things work together for good. God's got a plan and God's got a pur purpose there. And in this little book that Josh gave me on the book of Joseph, here's a quote from it. So why would God use sinful men in order to carry out His decrees? Why does God accomplish His purposes through sinful men? Well, where is God going to find a sinless man to use? Because we too once were foolish without any hope. Right? God's providence of who He puts in authority in our lives and over us is about His purposes and not ours. I know that God, Bodhi Bakum writes here, was willing to crush and kill His spotless, sinless Son for His own glory and for the salvation of His elect. How then can I fault Him when... And you can fill in that blank. That basically it's when things don't turn out my way. How can I fault Him? Did God accomplish His purposes through an evil and wicked empire, the Roman Empire? And through a King Herod? And through a Pilate, a governor? And the church there in, in, in Crete, those little groups of believers, are still under the rule and authority of the Roman Empire. And how are they to be subject to rulers and authorities? Uh, serving God. Here's another little quote from the book. Serving God in the context of slavery or prison. Maybe you think your, school, your classroom is slavery and prison. Because your teacher don't know nothing. Is disorganized. And it's awful. And it's mistreating you, you feel. And where do you turn? And what are you supposed to do? Or maybe it's your boss who's always on your case because your work's never good enough. When we serve God in the context of slavery or prison, it does not negate the fact that we're serving God. Right? He's still our God. Uh, one other little thing that I, I love from this little book was this idea. That when you struggle with those in authority, remind yourself of who God is. To get our theology right. It'll keep us from accusing God of evil as He works His plan of redemption in and through our lives. When we find ourselves in difficult places, for example, in prison, in the hospital, difficult place at work, at school, or in a nation where we live. He goes on, we will better be able to avoid thinking God's primary job is preventing inconvenience in our lives. Instead, we will acknowledge His sovereignty, providence, and commitment to what is best for His people. God is not there to make our lives convenient. And when our lives are inconvenient, inconvenienced, how do we respond? Might it be with godliness? And also a proper understanding of, of, of people, right? God says that vengeance is His. He'll repay. He'll make things right. Right? All people are sinful and fallen. It's really, really easy to criticize those in authority over us that they aren't doing their job right. But until you've been in their job, you don't know. 
and the people were quick to criticize, we really don't want to be in their job. Because it's not easy waiting tables. And we don't know what's going on in their home lives. And we don't know what burdens they're carrying up by themselves. And they maybe don't have God in their lives. So what do they do with their pressures? And sometimes they take it out on us, don't they? But God help us. Especially in this area of those in authority over us. Help us to be obedient. Bonhoeffer writes, The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, He bids him come and die. That's what the Christian life's about. Dying to self and being alive to Christ. And if Christ and God's goodness, love, grace, loving kindness gave us what we didn't deserve, God help us this week to give to somebody else something that they don't deserve either. Can you do that? Can you think about that? Is there a place you have to go back and apologize to somebody and make things right? Where do you in your week find that your rights and your demands come to the top? Write it in your prayer journal and pray that the Spirit will change who you are. That you will have the proper respect and obedience to those that God puts in authority over you. That you will be considerate and gentle. I was here Tuesday night at a wonderful uh, late night working on my sermon and I was driving through Xenia at about 11.45 and down 2nd Street and I was stopping at a stoplight there close to UDF and uh, I saw somebody walking along the road and they looked a little familiar and as they got by the street light I could see that it was Gary, my friend who works at the YMCA and I haven't seen Gary for uh, a couple of months and uh, I noticed he's just walking on the street. Usually he's riding his bike through town and uh, the window was already rolled down because my air conditioner works better that way. And uh, I said, Gary! And he came around and we stood at the driver's side of my truck for a couple minutes and there was no traffic and the uh, light went through a couple cycles and there was still no traffic and I asked him how he was and he had been helping somebody do some firewood and had a log fall on his arm and he broke his arm in two places he's been out of work for a couple weeks and it's going to be four more weeks or six more weeks before he gets to go back to work and he just looked terrible and he he was just a mess and he said what are you doing out so late I, said, I just was working on me sir well what are you going to talk about <laughs> what am I going to talk about all right well I'm talking about doing good to all people oh that's good I don't know if Gary's here today. He said maybe he'd come here and then catch Ahop in the afternoon. But uh, then he said to me, as we continued to talk a little bit, he said, you got 60 cents. Do you have 60 cents? It's late and I'm tired and I've just been reading about all this and guess what? I got 60 cents and I got a few minutes. Because Gary knows that I'm a follower of God and I've prayed with him at the Y. And how ironic is it that moments after I'm studying about doing good to all people, on my way home, God just puts Gary in my path. So he, he and a cigarette jumped in my truck and off we went to Speedway to get a speedy freeze and what a special little moment to do good to all people. And I just say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. 
May God give you an opportunity this week. To do good to all people when they're in need. That's kind of step one. But how about doing good to all people when they've hurt you? That's, that's the next level. But let's try it with God's power. Let's try it. So, Titus 3 and verse 8 says this. This is a trustworthy saying. And I hope I've represented God's truth well here this morning to you. And what I've said is something you can be trusted. Larry, thanks for praying for me this morning. He said, hey, all you're doing is delivering the package. And I said, well, I hope I don't damage the package. <laughs> right? Thanks, Larry, for your prayers. But 3 verse 8 says, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things, my buddy Titus. I want you to stress these things, that those who have trusted in God, those who believe in God, may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. To doing what is good. Grayson, would you come up, please? And Jacqueline, and as they do, just say again, the world is watching us. Maybe during this first song, you need to stay seated and have something to repent of. Maybe you need to walk out the back and grab some paper and write a note to somebody, a note of apology, and find them this week and give it to them. Maybe, like me, you need to uh, add a page in your prayer journal. I, I've had a page praying for our mayor and our city council, and Jared, and our police. But I had to add a page and add our president, Congress, Supreme Court judges to it, to pray for them. Because those are God's people that were to obey. Uh, I've been praying differently for the Ruffners, for the Brads, and for some in our church who I know struggle with broken systems that hurt. And I've been praying when people there see you guys coming, that they don't say, oh no, not them again. But they see you as bearers of grace and of love and of kindness. And so maybe this isn't touching you, but maybe you know somebody around you. Pray for one another that will be marked as people who do good to all people. Thank you, Lord.